Great. Okay. Before introducing our guest, I will uh, have to remind you that uh, this talk is going to be recorded. It has already started. And uh, to remind you uh, about the code of conduct that we have, which is uh, simple to behave good to each other. Don't write uh, stupid things on the messages, on the chat. And uh, while our guest uh, will start talking about the soft skills, please write your questions so that I can keep them on track and uh, ask him at the end of his talk. Uh, thank you, Patrocle. <laughs> okay, so our today's guest is uh, Patroclos, and uh, he is one of the programmers that uh, I admire, not because of his coding skill, which he has, and uh, this is why he's a uh, a principal software engineer after all at Elastic, but uh, because he's also trying to find ways to give back to the community, and I don't mean only to the programmer community, okay, but also to uh, our hometown here in Saoniki. I met Patroclos some years ago when I was a rookie, when I went to get my ticket and all the swags for the first Vox Days Thessaloniki that he was organizing. Really amazing event. Unfortunately, COVID has postponed it. So one thing brought the other. I went to the not only Java meetup that he's uh, the main organizer here in Salniki, both as an attendee and as a speaker. As a speaker, I, uh, I believe I came for uh, Kubernetes on Google Cloud Kubernetes and we had also a webinar. So that being said, thank you, Patrocle, for accepting my invitation. I'm really glad that uh, you are here with us today and uh, the stage is yours. Thanks a lot, Ilya, for the warm, warm welcome. Um, I'm really super excited to to give a talk at uh, TDG virtual events. Um, yeah, Ilya has already uh, said a few things about me. Let me share my screen so we can also uh, look at um, my slides. Give me a second. And... Right screen to, uh, yeah, you can see it. So I'm gonna start playing. Okay, so um, today's uh, discussion is about um, soft skills. And um, yeah, I have given this talk uh, more than a couple of times uh, during the COVID pandemic. And I will explain why I have decided uh, to give that not very technical talk. Uh, I have put uh, inside brackets uh, on purpose uh, the word soft. Uh, and, and these skills actually, they're not only targeting for developers, they can be applied to any professional. But since I assume that most of us, they are, uh, if not developers, but highly related to the um, programming world. That's why I, I, I named this talk uh, like this. So my name is uh, Patroklos Papetru. Uh, a few things about me. Uh, I live in Thessaloniki in Greece, like Elias. Uh, I work from home the last um, six years, mainly for, for companies uh, based uh, in the US. Right now, uh, I'm a principal software engineer uh, at Elastic. For those that uh, never heard of Elastic, you might have heard their products. Uh, it's it's a company behind Elasticsearch, Kimbana, Logstars, and other uh, great open source uh, products. Um, now it's time for me to reveal my age. I have more than 25 years in software engineering, so I don't have to play John Bon Jovi uh, to figure that out. Uh, I'm father of two kids, two boys around the age of 10 and 12. And uh, as Ilya said, I'm, I'm, I, was, I was organizing uh, some tech events before the COVID era. Um, hopefully we will start again doing things once the pandemic is over. Not expecting to be done before the end of this year. So uh, yeah, fingers crossed. So why I decided to do that, uh, that talk, what has changed, not the last year from the pandemic, but uh, I believe that this change has started 
uh, even before uh, the COVID era. Um, a few things that have been, uh, let's say, transforming the way we work, or at least the environment we work. Um, first of all, remote working is now uh, definitely a necessity, but thanks uh, to this pandemic, uh, many companies have discovered it as not only like a uh, necessary evil, but something that can help people be more productive or can help people work uh, in a more uh, in a safer environment. Uh, so definitely, remote working has changed the way we operate uh, as developers, as companies, as as organizations, our teams, whatever. Um, Multicultural environments, this thing actually is not new. Uh, I mean, for companies that they are uh, that they have offices uh, in, in, in multiple countries, uh, probably some of you have already uh, uh, worked together with people in, in different countries or in different uh, continents. Um, uh, so this is not uh, uh, definitely not new. Recently, I have talked to many also, um, let's say, uh, people that are hiring uh, developers and engineers, and they have started valuing uh, the soft skills. I wouldn't say a lot, but they have started to, to value them a bit more than, than in the past. Uh, I have also discussed with some people that they are doing like... Um, mind games during the hiring process to figure out exactly the kind of soft skills that candidates have and if they are a good fit for for uh, for a company uh, for a specific job um, so soft skills are becoming like I would say equal to the technical skills although I believe that they should but they are getting more traction uh, as we move forward. Diversity, um, I know that a lot of companies are trying to be uh, as much as diverse as they can uh, by hiring people or giving the same opportunities to uh, people from underrepresented groups or minorities or any kind of pe group of people that uh, don't have the same uh, or equal opportunities to the uh, uh, to job openings. And last but not least, uh, our job, I mean, software engineering, is not just writing code. Uh, when I started my career 20 years ago, 25 years ago, definitely I didn't care about anything else. I was, I only wanted to write code, give me some specs, some some design documents that let me write code without having to talk to anyone. Nowadays is, I would say, totally different. Um, there are lots of collaboration not only in the same team, cross teams. So we need to have, let's say, uh, a different set of skills. Now, the question is, why are we calling them soft? I have no idea. I, I, I don't like calling them soft skills, but they are known like this. So that's why I, I named this, uh, I gave this title to the um, uh, presentation. You can find them also as work skills or essential skills or non-cognitive skills. Uh, and that's the opposite uh, skills. It's like hard skills, which uh, usually uh, we call the technical skills, uh, like how many programming languages we know or uh, frameworks or cloud providers or anything that has to do with uh, technical ability of uh, uh, op operating uh, tasks. I would say that you can also imagine those skills, that soft skills, work skills, or whatever. It's whatever we haven't been told about when we were students, because nobody told us how to communicate. Nobody told us how to respect people. Everything in the university was like how to learn this programming language, how to learn algorithms, how to learn design, how to analyze systems, blah, 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 all this stuff. And the bad thing is that we have to learn them the hard way, or at least this is my experience, and that's why this is what I'm sharing. Um, we learn them the hard way when it comes to deal with a situation or a specific case in, in our uh, professional environment. We have to learn how to practice soft skills or specific soft skill depending on the circumstances. Now, the, 
some people ask me, okay, how many soft skills are out there and do I have to master all of them or what's, which are the most important ones? So if you, if you do some kind of internet search on Google, you can find thousands of articles. And if you try to categorize or classify those soft skills, probably you can find dozens or even hundreds. Definitely you can't and you don't and you shouldn't master all of them um, because it's almost impossible and because not all companies value the same ones. Um, but uh, I, I, I will try to summarize what I believe are the most important ones in this, in this presentation, in this, in this uh, talk and to give you a quick idea of the areas that we can improve ourselves as, as professionals. And I think that those soft skills that I'm going to discuss, they are pretty much the same uh, in all environments and they are at least essential um, to any kind of um, job operation. So let's get started. Um, first of all, self-disciplined, you can find also uh the same skill with some other variations like self-monitoring or self-directed self-supervising or self-motivated um why do we need to be self-disciplined what does this mean to us this applies mainly to remote engineers or people that are working remotely but i would say that it's also super helpful and useful to engineers that they are just working uh in a traditional let's say, co-located environment, uh, space or, or, or work office. Um, it's super easy, especially now that most of us are working from home or how I prefer call it to work from quarantine, which is quite different from working from home. It's just super easy, as I was saying, to, to get distracted, okay? And um, instead of working on a specific task, do something else or uh browse on instagram or facebook or give a talk like like i do right now <laughs> so it's 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 very easy to get distracted and um uh, you might end up sitting on your desk for eight hours without actually doing uh, nothing that's not only the only problem with productivity but also uh it's important even if you're working on uh, a physical uh office because you can, if, if you stay focused and you are self-disciplined, uh, then you can avoid micromanagement, okay? You can deliver things without working overtime and you can achieve a better work-life balance, which is all we want, right? I mean, if you're focused and you have, you're motivated, you, you don't need anyone outside, um, uh, anyone else, your boss, your team leader to always, you know, micromanage you, asks you every two or three hours how you're doing. Um, if you can be self-disciplined and you can focus on something and deliver it on time, uh, I think we can achieve uh, great things on that. The second soft skill, exchanging feedback. Let me explain why it's exchanging and not like only accepting. Um, I have probably all of us, we are giving and getting feedback in several ways, okay, in formal and non-formal ways. Um, what I mean by exchanging feedback is like not only accepting feedback, but also seeking for feedback. I mean, we should ask people, our colleagues, our supervisors, or maybe even colleagues from other departments, other teams, give feedback to us about our work, uh, even our behavior or our skills or anything that we believe that we can get better. Um, and apparently we should be um, ready to accept feedback, uh, even if it's not the one that we were expecting to get. Uh, now, when we are giving feedback, uh, definitely, it should be constructive, uh, I assume, and it should be more like an objective uh, presentation of our um, uh, opinion for someone else. Try not to hurt their feelings or, uh, you know, disrespect them, stuff like that. Um, 
and let me give a very small, a very quick example that probably all of us have experienced, especially if we are writing code. I guess that in a very simple engineering process, uh, a development lifecycle, when we are ready to submit our code, we are creating a pull request on Git or any other similar tool. Now, the time that we are submitting that pull request, we are asking people to give us their feedback about our code. So it's a very simple scenario that happens multiple times a day within a team. So don't feel like feedback has to be a very formal process that has to happen once every three months. I mean, those they are valid methods, like to give a, a, to get a, a formal, let's say, um, to have a formal meeting with your supervisor and get some feedback uh, or have a, uh, a review meeting uh, every semester. That's totally fine. It's a formal um, way of uh, getting feedback, but feedback can be um, exchanged daily. And that's why I gave you the uh, same scenario of a pull request. Now, feedback has to go from all over places like we should uh, ask uh, to get and also give feedback to our supervisors, like I said, to colleagues in the same department and colleagues from or other departments, other teams, always in a very constructive uh, way. Let me move to, move to the next one. Uh, this is called empathy and um, uh, it's a totally a Greek word. So if, you, if it sounds Greek to you, you can also keep the same vari variation about emotional intelligence or compassion. Um, in other words, all those three mean uh, actually describe the ability of an individual to um, understand uh, their own emotions, pro first of all, and that will allow us to understand the emotions of others. Now, definitely um, people might have bad days. Uh, some people are not able to leave their personal problems out of work and, and vice versa. So it, it, it's, it could be great if we can feel that pain or that stress that other people might have. Um, and not, on, not only feel, that, feel it, but also communicate to, to others that, hey, I understand your emotions, how you feel, I've been there and I share the same, um, uh, the same, the same pain. I have empathy for you. Uh, you don't have to feel bad about that. Um, this will actually in increase the, the, the trust between coworkers. Uh, I have said that it, it, it increases the team spirit. If we let people know that, hey, don't worry, I'm, I'm, I'm there for you. Uh, I can cover you or I can, I can do some extra work for you until you feel better. Um, when we do so, uh, we always need to keep in mind that we don't have to be judgmental. I mean, we don't judge people for having a bad day or having some personal problems, but we uh, we make them feel that we are supportive to them. Uh, and if we do so, we will end up having, which is, I think, very important to every company, to uh, create a blameless uh, culture. Uh, like there's, we don't blame people for doing something wrong. I mean, we are people, we always make mistakes. That's in our nature, okay? Because I didn't sleep well last night, I was not able to um, to fix that bug in, in three hours or I introduced that aggression. I mean, things happen like this to, uh, to everyone. Uh, it's our job to make sure that there's, there's a culture which is blameless. Uh, I mean, definitely ownership should happen, but this is completely different to some kind of, of, of blaming everyone for, for making mistakes. Um, empathy is very important. It requires, first of all, like I told you, to understand our own emotions, okay? Express our emotions and then try to understand the emotions of others and tell them that we uh, uh, understand their own emotions. Uh, let's move to another topic about uh, persuasion, uh, which can be found also uh, negotiation. I mean, that might sound uh, uh, in the first place like, hey, this is not a skill for, for an engineer. I mean, it's like a skill for a politician, right? Or someone who wants to uh, to be elected as uh, as a mayor. Well, 
it's it's not about um, forcing our opinion. Uh, I mean, in, in a team, definitely we have people that they have been in, in the same team for, for, for more years, they have more experience. So it's not about forcing our opinion because we have X number of years in the same company or the same role, okay? Uh, I mean, uh, it, it's, it's about how we can present our, our opinion uh, with constructive arguments, arguments that they are valid and they are covering all the aspects of our, uh, our, our proposal or our, our, our uh, idea. Uh, and at the same time, we should be able to answer all concerns and maybe change our mind if during this discussion, this negotiation, it's proven that our, let's say, statement was not completely accurate or it's not like completely correct or it has like some technical um, uh, holes. So it's like negotiation, persuasion about doing something. But again, we don't use our you know, authority based on years. We use our authority based on technical excellence and how we can convince people by presenting our our approach in a holistic way, okay? Um, next thing is about, um, this is quite simpler and maybe easier to, to digest. So it's the, what I call internal learner. And also you can find some variations like willingness to learn or desire to learn or technology trend awareness. Uh, so what's this all about? Probably you have experienced that. I mean, we are living in a, in a, in a super fast and uh, changing world. And every couple of weeks, you can see a new uh, framework popping up, new technologies, new programming languages. What we learned two years ago might not be useful today. Uh, and even worse, things that uh, were useful and then died. Now they are back again uh, useful. I mean, this is the great. Python is a great example. Python, I was learning Python 20 years ago, and then uh, it just disappeared because nobody was using it. And then five years ago, then pff, it became again hype because of all this uh, uh, machine learning uh, uh, tools that they are using Python because it creates math, uh, math friendly programming uh, language. So my point is that be ready and be. Um, uh, um willing uh to learn and also unlearn another example um i mean the agile manifesto and the agile way of doing things started around uh 20 years ago it evolved and now i mean there are so many agile practices or frameworks but uh, I don't think that many companies are strictly following them, especially now that we're doing remote. So things are changing completely, even on the technology part or on the process or the frameworks part. Uh, so we need to be to adapt to these these changes and ready to to learn. Uh, but there is there is um, a danger here. Um, I think there are a couple of articles that I have read in the past talking about the uh, hype driven development the hdd uh it's the trap that we the developers usually fall into uh but we are trying to keep the hype of everything and try to learn all these new things that they are they're out which is completely um um impractical and uh, unrealistic you can't learn anything everything that is you know uh said on the internet uh, every day what you can do and what we can do is uh focus on 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 our areas of um, uh, interest and make sure that we're keeping up with all the latest news. Um, uh, we are learning new things. And if there is a new area that we want to um, to discover a bit more, we can also add it to our uh, list of, of, of areas of, of topics of interest. You can definitely be on top of uh, everything. This is not going to learn and probably it will make you miserable or, um, cause you more stress because you might feel that, hey, I, I, I don't know how to do AI or how to do apply this machine learning algorithm. Just be uh, an expert on your on a single field or a couple of fields, and then you can um, uh, 
uh, just you know read some high level articles for other uh, emerging technologies uh, unless you have to learn them for your uh, professional uh, work. Um, uh, one more thing, delegation, or to simply put it, learn how to say no. Okay, um, if I if I had to give this talk in a physical environment, I would just ask people to raise their hands and tell me how many times have you said no the last month. Probably there will be uh, very few people. And then how many times have you accepted a task knowing that you don't have the capacity to do it? I guess more people will raise their hands because for some reason it's our nature to say yes even when we know that we can't make it because we have already a pile of tasks uh, on our plate. Um, and about delegation, ask yourself how many times you didn't trust your coworker, your colleague to do something because you can do it better or you can do it faster. These are very common symptoms uh, or anti-patterns that we, the engineers, tend to do because, why? Because we are proud, right? Because we can do everything, we can fix everything, even if we have to, to work for over time or during the weekends, I mean, we can make it. Well, I, I'm sure that all of us, we can make it. There's no doubt about that. But we need to learn how to say no. Actually, if you start to say no, I mean, not all the time, but when you justify, when you give a negative answer, people will start to respect you more because they can realize that you, as a member of the team, know exactly what are your boundaries, what are your technical expertise, your technical excellence, and you can be more, be more productive by doing the things that you can do in your specific time frame. Um, it might be more important mainly for, let's say, team leads, especially to delegate manager supervisors, but I would say that any principal or senior engineer should master the art of saying no and a delegation to other colleagues, other team members, okay? Um, we have touched base a little bit about trust. Uh, let me explain a bit more or uh, analyze it uh, for a few minutes. Trust is not only trusting other people, but try to make others trust you. Um, I don't know how many companies start with the assumption that trust is everywhere, where we should. I mean, by default, we should trust all co-workers, uh, no matter what. It's like in the court when you are, by default, you are innocent until proven the opposite, okay? So by default, we should trust everyone in the company, unless that person proves that he's not the right person to trust, okay? Now, I don't want you to get this wrong. What I mean is we should focus on trusting the people's skills, not the people's willingness to do something. And that's actually a continuation of the previous slide. Um, Everyone should be willing to do something. Yeah, I'm willing to rewrite this tool in a brand new language that is super cool that I would like to learn. Well, yeah, this is your willing to do it, but can you do it? Have you, have you got the skills to do it uh, and give some business value to the company, to the team? Uh, that's the thing we should start asking ourselves and trust people to do that, okay? Um, so that confidence that we are building, if we keep it alive, then on top of that, we can build definitely uh, creative partnerships and long-lasting long uh, uh, teams that can operate and live uh, and reach uh, uh, an excellent state for, of, of uh, uh, quality work and uh, productivity. Now, the next step of trusting people is actually respecting each other. Now, respecting is quite difficult and you can see that there is there's a cycle in there because when you give respect, probably you should get respect and that will give another round of giving and sharing and uh, back again to us. What we should respect? 
there are definitely several differences of individuals. People are coming from uh, different countries, different local ethics, diversity, okay, from different um, technical backgrounds, um, anything that can make people completely different from our mentality, our state of mind or whatever. To achieve this kind of respect and recognition or appreciation as I'm, I'm explaining below, I mean, the variations are almost the same. We can have a few tips, like when we want to praise someone or to give kudos, do it in public. This might be like a uh, an open wide company meeting or a Slack channel or anything that you are using for a communication that everyone can see or send a company wide email by praising someone. You can give it in public. You should give it in public. Okay. Also, show your appreciation when someone helped you to accomplish something. Don't get the credit only by you. I mean, when you announce that, hey, I have accomplished this, but I shouldn't have done it or reach that far without the help of Elias or whatever. And again, do that in public. Do you have something negative to say? Well, do it in private, okay? Directly only to that people, or even better, on during a video call, especially nowadays if we can't have a face-to-face -face interaction, okay? Definitely face-to-face -face interaction is the best thing to do, but given the circumstances, a video call is, is the best way to uh, say something negative, but again, at the same time, showing how much you respect that uh, person. If we try to do so, uh, then the respect and recognition cycle probably will be endless and will keep looping inside the company uh, across all the uh, individuals. Uh, we are reaching the end, and um, I would like to highlight a very important uh, item. I mean, this was one of the most hard, the hardest thing that I had to um, uh, to master. Be a listener, okay? And a couple of variations that you can find out there is the active listening, or pay attention to the details. Um, what are the benefits? Uh, definitely, if you listen to the other people's opinion or what they have to say. For sure, we can make better decisions because we now have a better understanding of a situation or we have listened to a different point of view of a specific problem, okay? But how we can prove or how we can make other people feel that we are listening and we are paying actually attention, <clears throat> sorry, to the details of, of, of their uh, argument. There are a couple of tips, like you can paraphrase what they said to show that you understood what they are saying, okay? Uh, or just use like some brief verbal affirmations like, hmm, sure, okay, I know, or I see, or I understand. Things like that during this discussion make the other pe person uh, feel that we are paying attention to what they are saying and we are actively listening to that person. Then we can have more high level uh, reactions like we can ask uh, specific questions to seek more clarification uh, or ask open ended questions. Okay. Um, try not to express your opinion. I mean, wait to, to disclose it until everyone else has spoken. Uh, and this will, will not affect their opinion. I mean, you will not try to, you know, prove your opinion is, is the correct one. If you have some similar experience or some similar arguments, now it's the time to disclose them, uh, and this will actually show to the to the um, uh, co colleague or your co-worker that you actually understand them uh, and you are listening to them. If we do so, definitely we're going to build trust. It's another way of building trust, being a listener. Uh, respect because other people know that when they have a problem or they have they want to discuss a technical solution, they will come to you because they know that you are going to listen to them, okay? And you are not going to try to convince them about your opinion. And last but not least, you are going to learn. I mean, when you listen to other people, 
definitely there is hidden knowledge on what other people say. So it's always a chance to learn something new, even if we don't realize it that moment. Definitely we can learn something when we're discussing uh, and actively listening to other people's uh, opinion. What about communication? Um, again, during the pandemic, communication has changed a lot and I really hope that this will come back to normal. Um, there is there, are, there is this, a quite significant list of how we can communicate with other people. Uh, I have here a few ideas. Now, body language is, is very important, but this is also uh, quite uh, tricky, especially in multicultural environments, because body language is not the same to all, to all countries or all continents. I would propose to use very um, objective um, uh, body language or very simple body language or use it when you know that other people share the same uh, cultural background with you. Um, apparently, verbal communication, it's the most important one. That's why I said before, when you have to say next and negative, use a and you can't have it face to face, use a, a, a video conferencing uh, conference uh, tool so you can say it verbally without having to write. When we write something in an email or a chat um, uh, platform, it's just a very, I would say, typical cold message that hides usually our emotions or the way we are saying things. So verbal communication um, is, is setting it's also the most important things. It can happen in multiple groups, like co-workers, uh, with your customers, um, anywhere, in, with your boss or your subordinates, anything. And now, non-verbal communication is actually quite important sometimes. Um, and this actually refers to um, the tone of voice when you want to be, you know, sarcastic or you want to highlight something, this is very important. Uh, also some gestures like I'm doing like here right now, or some facial expressions when you want to show like your approval or your disagreement or anything that can show to other people how you feel or how you re react during a conversation. Um, Sometimes this is quite uh, easy because you don't need to speak the same language or you don't need to express exactly in their own words. But looking at someone's face, you can understand how that person feels or thinks about uh, that discussion. Um, now, verbal communication uh, can also happen in, in, in many forms and we should try in the company to try to, to, to achieve these forms. We can have also group meetings, we can have one-to-one -one discussions, we can have uh, inside training sessions or presentations uh, uh, for a specific topic or specific technical um, discussion theme. Um, I, I, I spend a bit more time about communication because I think this is the one of the key, let's say, elements uh, that can differentiate a successful team with a not so much successful team. Lack of communication might lead to bad decisions, to bad implementations, misunderstandings, and uh, even having like kind of um, arguing about things without any uh, actual outcome. But let's move to the last one, uh, which is a bit... Um, I would say uh, not simple, but it might not be as uh, obvious as uh, the other ones. It's a positive attitude. Uh, there are definitely lots of variations. I've listed some of them. Enthusiasm, friendliness, humorous, patience. All this can create a positive attitude. Uh, apparently, not everyone can be humorous, okay? Or not everyone can be, have the same level of friendliness to other uh, other peers, other colleagues. But if we can try to to uh, embrace some of them, or we can, I mean, 
okay, if you can't be uh, humorous, you can have enthusiasm or you can be a team player, okay? Or if you can't have patience, you can have some energy inside with a team. We can't have all of them, definitely, I, I don't. But if we have a positive attitude with some of these variations, then people like this are more likely to be understood, okay? Because you are giving like a positive vibes to people. Definitely people like this uh, are more likely to be trusted by other peers. And if you are during a hiring process, I, I'm certain that you have more chance to get hired if you show some of these uh, variations of a positive uh, attitude. So to summarize, positive attitude is not like something that you can learn. It's coming from yourself. Uh, and it's something that you can express with a few variations, not only to uh, people that you are working with, uh, but to anyone, uh, not only on your professional environment, but to your family, your friends, anyone. If you start with a positive attitude, I'm pretty sure that you will get the same vibes from the other person, or at least they will be tempted not to be aggressive or negative uh, against you. So that was the 10 plus one. Okay, um, soft skill I wanted to, to share with you. Uh, I think I'm done. Uh, we can have now questions or I can elaborate a bit more about the specific uh, uh, soft skill. I try to make it uh, compact and not, no more than 30, 35 minutes. So uh, attending a virtual call is not the best thing to do these days. So I didn't want to, uh, to make it boring. So passing the ball to Elias again and waiting to see if we have any questions. Okay, so I will start from your plus one, soft skill, <laughs> positivity. And uh, for me, uh, I'm trying to be so positive that I'm uh, sending vibes to negative people and they run away from me. So I prefer it that way. And until now, you have only two questions, maybe three. So first question is from Ioannis. Do you believe that someone who starts his career is better to explore and change different sub areas or stay at specific one and become expert at it? Um, I guess it's not about soft skills, it's about the technical areas, right? I assume. Well, yeah. Um, when you're in the beginning of your career, I think that, um, yeah, you should focus on a couple of, uh, I would say, areas. Uh, so you can prove that you are good at what you're supposed to do. Uh, but I'm sure that during the next stages of your career, you can expand uh, your areas of uh, expertise and you know become what we call a polyglot developer, polyglot engineer. But yeah, in the beginning, it's always uh, better to focus on a couple of areas of um, an area. I mean, not like learning a couple of programming languages, but uh, areas, I mean, do you like machine learning? Then focus on machine learning. Do you like to be a hardcore DevOps engineer? Well, master Linux or whatever, okay? But don't focus on a specific programming language or a specific JavaScript framework to put it nicely. Okay, second question. More questions are coming. Great. It's uh, from uh, Zara. How do you treat a more experienced colleague who has to help you learn something due to his position and your lack of experience, but purposely ignores to help you so as to do it himself? Uh, I'm reading the question again. How do you do the more experience? Okay. Uh, well, yeah, that's a good question. This is what I would do. Um, I would, to, to justify my slides, I would use the, this is actually, I want to tell him something negative. So I would ask him to have a one-to-one -one or a face-to-face -face meeting or a one-to-one -one video meeting and tell him that what you did actually is disrespectful for me. I want to express that I don't like it. Uh, and I, would exp I want to explain also how do I feel with this attitude period, and I would end it there. And then I would seek help from another senior, senior, uh, senior guy. But definitely, I would express my feelings. 
uh, and try to, to help him understand that what he did was not the right thing to do. Great. Next question is from Jonathan. What do you think of the start with psychology, not technology? Start with end users to understand the needs. Um, well, I would argue that um, the era where engineers were supposed to understand the needs of end users has gone. Uh, I mean, in not big, but medium-sized companies, there are people that they are supposed to do that thing and filter out uh, all the user needs, user requirements, and then come up with some design solutions. These are called product, people are called product owners, okay? So I, I don't know, if you want to dive into the end users um, world, well, good luck. But you, you can't have, have it both at the same time. You can't be a great engineer and you can't be a great psychologist with end users. That's why we have invented product engineers. Okay, next question from Lefteris. Isn't it difficult to identify soft skills on recruiting? Definitely it is because most of the people are, especially young people or people that are starting their career right now, it's, it's, it's hard for them to actually show their real uh, personality. So that's why some of the companies are trying to do like role play games, like gathering 10 candidates in the same room and they're asking them to play a specific role uh, to figure out. And they're having also a psychologist uh, uh, monitoring them. Uh, uh, so or they're asking them to support an argument that, that they don't believe or like uh, playing the role of a of a lawyer of a lawyer uh, who is defending someone I don't know who committed a crime. Okay, uh, so how, they're trying to figure out ways. Definitely not in a piece of paper. Or sometimes there are there are some tests that you can evaluate. But role playing games, it's the best way to figure out the soft skills that you are a team or a company needs for specific candidates. Great. I believe we have finished. I don't see any more questions. We had a lot of food for thought. Thank you very much. And now it's your time again, Patrocle, <laughs> for your question. And the faster person that will answer correct will get a one year free subscription on uh, JetBrains. I will send him or her a voucher for, for one year. So the question is, yeah, yeah, so this will reveal actually my age again. Now, <laughs> indeed, do you know what was the name of the car used for time travel in the Back to the Future movies? Yes, yeah. Todori is still <laughs> oh. okay. Todori, you were too fast, man. <laughs> well done. Congratulations. Yeah, it's DeLorean. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Okay. This is uh, the first time that I see... So fast people answering, <laughs> amazing. The fourth sequel is coming out, if you don't know it, guys, <laughs> with the same actors. Okay. So, Thodori, uh, I don't know if uh, we are connected on LinkedIn. Please uh, connect with me on LinkedIn so I can share the voucher with you for JetBrain. And uh, it was about milliseconds. So uh, I think I have to also share to Golfo and Jonathan uh, so people, if you also want to get, it was uh, really fast on the milliseconds. So I believe that we can share three vouchers this time. I don't know. Patrick, like, what do you think? Well, Favoris has already won, so we can give it to Golf and Jonathan. Uh, I mean, they, okay. were, they were super fast, all three of them. Okay, Favoris have it. So we have Golf and Jonathan. Please, you two. Send me a message on LinkedIn and you'll get your JetBrain voucher. That's it from us. Our next event for the GDG Cloud Saloniki is going to be on February the 17th. It's going to be for imposter syndrome and how mentorship can help you. So stay tuned. I will publish it tomorrow on the social media and I will try to have the time correct this time.
<laughs> okay. Thank you very much for everything. Thank you so much, Ilya. Have a have a good evening, folks. See ya. Bye. Bye bye.